So. Okay, hello, welcome to this PLEWA masterclass in which we are going to analyze the 2022 election results and link them to syllabus dot points in years 11 and 12. Uh, my name is Daniel Tomlinson, I teach politics and law at Kareen Senior High School. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Perth region, the Wajuk people. Um, I'd really like to recognize the strength and resilience of the Noongar people in the southwest of, of WA and pay tri tri uh, tribute to their contribution in our region. Um, I think this is particularly important given that the 2022 election saw uh, the re-election of Dorinda Cox to the Senate, uh, as well as the loss of Ken Wyatt, the first Indigenous member of the House of Representatives, and also the first Indigenous Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Tonight's Masterclass is going to be run by Brendan Crozier, who teaches politics and law at Aquinas College. Uh, I will be serving as humble chat moderator, so I'll be collating questions and firing them at Brendan when appropriate. These sessions work best when you guys get involved and generate discussion, uh, whilst also helping us focus on the syllabus dot points that you would like to hear talked about the most. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Brendan and I will look at them where appropriate. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. So I'll hand over to Brendan now. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's quite pleasing actually to see so many people turning up um, to this and being able to, I really, I guess, both teachers and students and being able to sort of get involved um, in yeah, what is a reasonably interesting um, election. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so I will just make this a touch bigger for you. Um, so basically, I guess as a bit of a disclaimer, all of the sort of stats and things like that that are um, in this PowerPoint are, are from a sort of time period when I was setting this up. So roughly um, the last week or so. So if some data is slightly yeah. out, um, then I do apologise for that. But, um, yeah, it's just the, the nature of the beast of trying to organise this. Um, there was some late additions today because we obviously have a new, a new senator being confirmed in Victoria. Um, so I guess... Going, going through here as well, this, this presentation will try to cover as much as possible. Um, and I guess it, it is very difficult given how, I guess, sort of wide reaching this election has been and all the different directions you can take it in. I, I, I won't be able, I guess, to cover necessarily everything um, that has occurred, but my job really here is to try and, I guess, direct both students and teachers um, to, the, to the areas that are probably the most relevant to both year 11 and the year 12 syllabus. So um, if there are any things that you're a little bit unsure of or you want to um, sort of clarify, um, please do um, address those in the chat and then, yeah, we can, um, we can go through those um, throughout, the, throughout the masterclass. So I guess to sort of start us off, really the, the sort of the, the key thing I guess I want to take everyone sort of through is, is, is what were the, some of the big takeaways. Um, so not Scott Morrison tackling a, a child a couple of days out from the election, but what, what can we actually a, apply to the syllabus? So certainly it's, it's, it's been well noted that the decline of the major parties was a big one. Um, seats changing hands is always a really important one. And, and I guess from there as well, that that's kind of linked to the decline of the major parties through the rise of um, certainly the independents in those moderate liberal seats. Some of the mandates so that that I find certainly when I'm teaching anyway, um, mandates is a really tricky concept for a lot of students to grasp um, because it is so theoretical, but we can actually see some some tangible mandates um, in this in this election and then some other areas of the syllabus that that you can link to the election and, and I think that's the key thing with any example that that you have or anything that you have in your example bank is how can you link it to multiple areas of the syllabus to get to get bang for your buck so um obviously something that's come out pretty pretty recently um is the well multiple i guess referendum proposals that we're potentially looking at um, with a new government but yes one of my favorite moments from the election um there i guess um, being being scomo so in terms of some areas of interest and this isn't necessarily something that a lot of people, I guess, are interested in, in in terms of sort of deep diving into some of the seats that change hands. I, I, I think it's important from our um, perspective to certainly look at both the year 11s and, and for year 12. So the accountability aspect for the 12s, but also um, year 11, this this time of year, you're starting to look at um, you know, the role that elections play and 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 what you know what is a swing, those types of things as well. So it, it it's very tempting just to focus, I guess, what the media has sort of highlighted in that would be most of the things on the right hand side of that table um, through the the teals or the greens and whatnot but there were some really big implications for both both major parties so labor 
generally most of these um I guess swings were positive. So Cowan was a really interesting one. That 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 was a really marginal seat going into the going into the election. It now sits at a margin of you know sort of nine point nine percent. So that's a that's a massive sort of swing towards the Labor Party there. Um, in terms of Western Australian perspective as well, Ann Ali is now a is now a member um, of both that seat in Cowan, but also a minister of the government as well, which is important. Um, some other areas that I think probably got overlooked a little bit more so that you know it, it was seen as a loss for the coalition but cert certainly in terms of labor the seat of fowler was a really interesting one there was that and Parramatta in new south wales where two candidates were basically parachuted in that didn't live in the electorate uh christina Keneally being one her her role in the opposition was pretty prominent she she certainly would have been a minister uh, in the government and she had a massive swing against her um so the independents weren't just the teals that everyone sort of talked about um, they were also in other areas. They didn't just target uh, Labor seat, or sorry, Liberal seats as well. Hunter was another one, just, just more, I guess, sort of in terms of you could look at accountability um, through elections, but also mandates as well in terms of Hunter, which had a significant swing against uh, Labor in the 2019 election due to some confusion around policy. I would actually swung back towards the Labor Party, um, not by a lot, but by enough, which I guess sort of you're looking at accountability, that electorate. I guess sort of you know swung back more towards the natural heartland. In terms of the coalition, obviously there's some you know some obvious ones in terms of um, you know Kuyong for example. Bass was an interesting one. Uh, if you're looking at the roles that that individual members can play, cer certainly in terms of uh, the the functions of Parliament, Bridget Archer was was the sitting member for Bass. Um, she actually increased her margin, which was certainly not the national swing uh, for the coalition and. She is important because she was one of the five MPs who crossed the floor um, relating to the religious discrimination bill um, that, that was in the parliament before the election. So that's a result of note. Uh, certainly closer to home in Moore. Um, Ian Goodenough, I think, probably has the best name for a politician. Um, he was just good enough because he was able to stay in his seat, uh, but a massive swing against him. And if you're familiar with state politics in WA, his role in the Klan, uh, in, in terms of maybe having a bit too much influence over the Liberal Party, was that a response by the electorate um, against him? It's a significant swing, considering Labor didn't put a whole lot of effort into that seat. That was one of note. Certainly Wentworth as well. So it's the second time Dave Sharma's lost to an independent. He was heavily critical um, of ScoMo after the election. Um, interesting as well that he was what would we class as a moderate in the Liberal Party. Um, again, always interesting when an MP criticises the government after they lose, not, not whilst in Parliament. So again, looking at representation, there's some um, points of note there. Closer to home curtain, uh, one that I'm sure has come up in a few classrooms. One of my posters behind me came from came from Curtin. Um, Kate, Kate Cheney, massive swing for her. So 15.6% against the Liberal Party. She'll obviously form part of the crossbench uh, in, in the House of Reps. And then one we'll get to in a little bit is um, the seat of Brisbane, but also just widely in terms of Queensland. Massive swing towards the Greens in Queensland. Swings away from the LNP, but also from Labor, which could, could point to some interest uh, in, in 2025 as well. So just some results of note, maybe some you haven't considered. Lots of people will focus on Kuyong and probably Curtin as well, but but some other areas. If you're looking for some other examples, to not just talk about the same examples, people people will often bring up. Um, you know, there's some there that that you can use, and perhaps it sparks your interest uh, in some other areas. So this was probably one of the biggest takeaways from the from the election, one that was covered pretty heavily um, both on election night and afterwards. The data I've got there is. Is, is from the sort of start of this week. I've, I've pulled most of my data from the ABC website, um, just as it's a little bit more sort of, um, I guess, year 11 and 12 friendly than, than uh, the AEC's one. Um, a, one that doesn't often get a run, Wikipedia is usually pretty good. Once all of the uh, the data is finalised and, and, and it's all sort of official, um, that, that's quite good in terms of visual representations as well. So I, I think... In, in, in terms of this, rather than getting caught up in the politics, and this can certainly be an issue I found with my students, is that generally speaking, students of, of this age and, and, and demographic tend to lean a little bit more towards the left. Um, and it's about sort of, I guess, just putting aside the politics and look at the actual data, what actually occurred here. So not your personal opinion of Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party or Anthony Albanese and whoever, what actually occurred. Um, and you can see that on the primary vote, um, both the Labor Party and the coalition had massive swings against them. The Greens had a massive swing towards them. Uh, One Nation, it, they did have a swing, a 1.9% towards them. That can be attributed to the fact that they ran 
in every available seat in the House of Reps, as opposed to primarily Queensland, where they ran in the last um, federal election. The UAP, very widely known that they spent, you know, significant amounts of money in this election. They had a, you know, a negligible swing towards them. But I mean, I guess overall, 604,000 votes you know, across the whole nation, given they spent something like $100 million on the election. So if you're looking in terms of the influence of political parties um, in this as well, in, and I guess in terms of the lawmaking process, well, United Australia can't have any influence on the lawmaking process because they couldn't get anyone in. Um, and that's something, so I guess, to take away um, from this as well. So if we're looking at mandates. We're, we're really seeing here that the, the public is giving a mandate to these minor parties, to the independents, obviously, as well. Um, but they're repudiating the, the mandates of both the coalition and the Labor Party, potentially maybe due to some of those inferences made in that cartoon there. Um, from Matt Golding, who's probably my favourite uh, political cartoonist, and that realistically, the, the main criticism of both major parties was that they didn't have a great policy platform, um, and that might have been one of the reasons why people turned away from them. Some other results of note. Um, so WA, we obviously know that there was a massive swing towards Labor, and a lot of this, I think, certainly the coalition put it down to the fact that McGowan and, and his government was able to, to really convince voters to, to vote and stay with Labor. Um, so they had a, they had a massive, massive swing towards them. Um, it's the most amount of seats Labor's had in WA for a very long period of time. Four seats gained, Libs lost five. Obviously the other one was picked up by Kate Cheney. In terms of other areas of note, you can see that it, it is different to the overall national result in that the Greens picked up more so federally, most of that anti-coalition vote went towards the Labor Party um, in WA. UAP, unsurprisingly, didn't poll all that well because of the Clive Palmer impact too. Queensland's interesting. Um, I, I guess both Queensland and Western Australia, you can look at them and sort of think, well, they're very similar, um, but differences there. So the Greens had a really big uptick in Queensland, which I guess would not be expected. Uh, it would be so I guess more expected One Nation or United Australia would have done better there. And, and you can see that, that that wasn't the case. Labor had marginal gains despite really targeting Queensland. They actually lost a seat compared to last time. Uh, the Greens picking up that as well. So what that sort of means for Labor uh, is very similar to what happened to the coalition at this election. It was a big swing away from the coalition in those teal seats. There, there is you know, speculation that, that a similar thing could happen to the Labor Party as well, potentially through the Greens or potentially in other areas, you know, more of those sort of working class um, suburbs. So everyone's favourite topic, um, teal independence. Uh, there are a vast amount of teal independence. Uh, I, I think really for this one in any sort of assessment you get, please do not just assume that a marker or your teacher knows who the teal independents are. I know you might know it, but it's one of those things that's really important to establish who they are because they aren't a political party. So, so please, even though they might act a little bit like a political party and the branding is somewhat similar, they're not, they're different. They are still independents um, and they share common goals. So they're different to say a Dylee and Fowler who is not a teal independent compared to some of the ones that are on the screen here. So predominantly they were female, um, economically conservative, you could say, and socially progressive candidates. So what does that mean? Well, they wanted action on climate change and they wanted a National Integrity Commission. Um, and the, the colour teal is genius because if you combine the Liberal Party and the Greens, you kind of come out with teal. So for, for voters in those areas, it's a safe choice. You're not going to the extremes of voting for Labor or the Greens. You're getting your action on climate change, but you're not going to have any sort of radical economic policies as well. So really good marketing from, from these independents, but a really simple platform, a really simple mandate for people to get behind action on climate change and a national integrity commission in terms of some other syllabus dot points as well you could focus on certainly the influence through pressure groups so climate 200 is one that will obviously get brought up a lot um, with the teals uh, but i think the really important thing as well is you can look at these uh, candidates through individuals as well and the role that they play in the parliament but also to the fundraising campaigns that they had predominantly the fundraising for these campaigns came from grassroots campaigns. Um, political parties, both, both major parties struggle to attract members. Uh, they struggle to get volunteers. You would have noticed this on election day. A lot of the people that volunteer for political parties are of a, are of a similar vintage. So these campaigns were really effective at getting grassroots support and that then can flow on into votes um, as well. 
how successful was it? Well, it overwhelmingly there was significant success for these um, for these independents. So Curtin, we know. Um, now the swings here are against the incumbent. Now they're two party preferred swings. So this is, I guess, important for the year 11 students here um, and for those teaching year 11 is that this, this data is based upon both the swing against the Liberal Party, but also to these candidates were taking votes off the Greens. They were taking votes uh, off uh, the Labor Party as well in a lot of these areas. And that, and that was flowing through in that two party preferred. Um, with that too, some of this data on the AEC is a little bit different to what we're getting on some websites like the ABC. Um, and that's, um, I guess I've tried to best reflect the swing here as possible, but you may find some slight differences. So Celia Hammond, she had a loss. Tim Wilson was an interesting one, 10.7% um, against him. And then we start going through some more sort of, I guess, high profile ones. So Frydenberg obviously being a, a cabinet minister was a big one. Uh, Zali Stegel, she actually had a swing towards her. So she was the incumbent independent. Um, and I guess what this shows is that if a candidate is representing their constituents in the parliament, upholding that representation function, acting as a delegate, then they are rewarded. And what we can, I think, see here as a general trend is that that style of trustee representation is not as popular anymore in the electorate based upon some of these massive swings, like McKellar, for example, that's almost a 16% swing. That's huge. So for that to occur is really something that I guess you know, I guess for something for the major parties to reflect on, but also for you guys and that you can use these um, as some examples. They weren't all successful. Uh, that's the main thing to remember here. Yes, predominantly there was a lot of success, but in seats like Bradfield, for example, Paul Fletcher was a minister. Um, he had a significant swing against him, but, but retained his seat. And seats like Cowper, for example, in, in regional areas, yes, there was a swing towards the the independent or the you know the teal backed independent but it it, it wasn't a guaranteed win uh, and certainly this is not a uniform approach lots of teals lost um so you know alex dyson for example um ex triple j presenter part of the teal movement he lost so it wasn't if you signed up to the teals you were going to going to sort of have a win other other independents as well so helen haynes for example she's a regional independent she wasn't necessarily a you know a teal but she continued to have her success in the parliament as well. So there, you know, don't just view them, view all independents as, oh, well, they're all teals. Yes, there were a lot, but there's there's lots of differences um, as well. Question I got here. So could the swing towards independence be a trend that will continue over the next couple of elections, changing the way we view our parliamentary system? I think that's a really interesting point. Um, certainly that seems to be the commentary coming out of out of this election. I, th I think for us to truly know that we need to see what happens to Labor once they face the electorate as well uh, and see potentially if the Greens pick up some more votes and maybe even some of those sort of more heartland sort of uh, working class areas, maybe they get targeted by, by a different group of independents, that, that would be interesting to see. I think if, if this were to say come up in an exam this year and, and you were looking to how can I use this as an example, I think the representation model would be really interesting, the theory and practice of parliament in that this is a great example of how the electorate is wanting a different style of representation um, and potentially going back to, to the beginnings of parliament, having that, that real sort of um, delegate one-on-one -on -one representation. So that, that would be an interesting point, I think, to consider. Um, and also too, it would be interesting once we sort of get the full set of data in as well, it would be interesting to see the voter turnout in these areas as well. And if, say, a seat like Curtin, for example, which has always been a safe Liberal seat, was the turnout up a little bit? Um, and if you, especially for the year 11s, if you're looking at that turnout or that informal voting rate, if the informal rate is down and the, and the turnout is up, you could potentially suggest that uh, the voters were engaged and this could be a trend that we could see going further on. Ultimately, their success will be viewed at the next election. If, if they deliver on their mandate, which is a small mandate, but it is a specific mandate, if they deliver on that, then potentially uh, this could be a trend that, that we see continuing. But one to watch, no doubt. Um, Brendan, can I just jump yes. in and ask a question? There was a lot of commentary in this election around whether there's such a thing as a safe seat anymore. Obviously, this links to our syllabus in a couple of ways. In year 11, safe seats are sort of a disadvantage of compulsory voting. Uh, it means that some 
trustees can sort of get away with being quite distant from their electorates while still getting elected. Uh, it also comes, you know, doesn't help with the accountability of members of parliament. Do you think there is such a thing as a safe seat anymore, given that we've had these massive swings uh, against incumbents in the 2022 election? I think certainly... Um, Jason Falinski and Trent Zimmerman were, were keen to sort of say that their seats weren't safe before the election. Mm. Um, I, I think to, to look at it from another point, look at Fowler, for example, I think Labor took that for granted that they were going to win that seat and they were going to put Christina Keneally in there and the electorate said, no, we don't want that. So I think if a political party chooses to take seats for granted and, and treat them as safe seats, well, um, they'll, they'll get similar results. So if, yeah, if, if politicians aren't upholding their mandate if they're not representing the people then no I, I don't think you can consider any seat safe um, and this is my last question for this bit do you think that this show perhaps like the outcome in these particular seats and the fact that the greens won more seats especially in queensland and we have in this sway of uh, independence coming into the parliament often instead of preferential voting that it still favors the major parties do you think that's still true, given that the primary votes were both were down for both major parties? Uh, I have a slide. Hopefully, it's. I'm just. I might just skip Sorry. forward. To the, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know if anyone's seen this graph. Um, if you don't listen to the Party Room podcast, please. If, if that's the one thing you take from tonight that you want to use someone else's resources, please listen to the Party Room podcast. Um, it's an excellent podcast, and it actually alerted me to this graph in that. We're looking here from 2004, um, so how government all the way to, to sort of now, and when was the AEC calling results? So if we go back to 2004, you could have uh, a result called on the primary vote, a significant number. You can see the, you know, the, the line, the red line there. It's been in decline ever sort of since then. Um, and certainly this last election, the, the DOP there standing for distribution of preferences in that over 70% of all electorates in this most recent election had to go through it, it, it that they, they had to distribute all the preferences really to be able to consider who was going to win that seat. So I think that that's the trend that, you know, the swings on to quote Anthony Green, um, that, that appears to be something that I think that that could stay in for a significant period of time, really given the dramatic drop off from 19 to, to this most recent election. Yes, thank you for Thank you for putting that in the chat. Wonderful podcast. Um, if you don't like the ABC, I'm sure there's one on the Australian or somewhere like that you can get as well. Um, something I think that is, I'm, I'm, I can't take credit for this uh, formula. This is obviously Stephen King's wonderful example organisation uh, formula, but it, it's something I guess that really, if you're not doing this in terms of organising your um examples it, 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 especially for the 11s this would be something really useful to do in that you know yes it's it's great if you can memorize lots of facts and figures and you can cram lots of stuff in but ultimately you need to make your examples work really hard and and rather than trying to remember a, a specific example for functions political mandates popular participation so on why not memorize one really rich deep example and see how you can branch it out into lots of different areas so certainly for teachers i think Kuyong is one I picked. I mean, this is this is a seat that that can apply in a number of areas. But what would be a great thing to use would be something like Curtin, for example. It's close to home. Um, it's got similar trends that other teal seats had, and, and I think students can probably relate a little bit more um, to a West Australian candidate and that and that sort of West Australian context as well. So you can apply this to to really any any seat in the country. Um, in terms of Kuyong, a couple of things. So the red uh, unit three. So I apologise to the year 11s. This is this is slightly biased towards the year 12s, but you can certainly reuse this. You know, the beauty of contemporary examples is you have three years to use them. Um, there's you know there's no requirement for you to learn new examples every year. If you've got something like this now, put this in your example bank and and use it again next year. Um, and you've already got you've already got something ticked off for a number of areas. So functions and political mandates are the unit three areas. Certainly. If we're looking at representation, I think I've already probably touched on that uh, a little bit, but it, it, Kuyong was considered a safe seat before that, before the most recent election. Uh, Frydenberg had a very strong public uh, profile, but what he was delivering for the people of Kuyong was not what they wanted anymore. Uh, certainly, it's probably difficult for us, given our experience with COVID, but there was a lot of anger in Victoria 
um, regarding Frydenberg's comments in Parliament regarding lockdowns and whatnot and things like that. And potentially that that was classed as maybe being an, an attributing factor for the swing against him. Um, certainly the mandate, I think if you remember, I haven't got it on one of the posters here, but I, I remember on election day, lots of Liberal Party uh, sort of core flutes sort of saying stronger economy, stronger future. Well, you know, what does that actually mean, for example? Um, whereas the Teals, in, and especially in Ryan's case, went with a really clear mandate. This is what we're going to do. We're going to have action on climate change. They obviously want to get that legislated through the parliament. National Integrity Commission is a really big thing as well. They're things that voters can latch onto. And when they go to the ballot box, yeah, I know what they stand for. What does strong economy, stronger future mean? You know, so you're voting for, for necessarily something you don't know. And, and both major parties were guilty of that as well. Certainly the Labor Party's campaign just seemed to be don't vote for Scott Morrison, um, which again, isn't a very compelling mandate for, for electors, which would probably suggest why, even though Labor has formed government, it wasn't in the massive majorities we saw, say, with Rudd, for example, in 2007. So I think there's issues for both political parties there in terms of the types of mandates they're trying to achieve. In terms of Unit 4 content uh, as well, so, I mean, obviously, accountability through the elections, this kind of works in uh, really nicely. Massive swing against Frydenberg. Again, I think Daniel's just pointed this out for Unit 2. Swings and whatnot are obviously a part of the Year 11 uh, syllabus as well. So 6.5% swing against him. But also, so Labor had a pretty big swing against him. 10.6% a size of a swing in the Greens. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Victoria, it is probably more of a left-leaning state. So the Greens have, have had a member in the House of Representatives for a long time in Melbourne um, through Adam Bant. But they had a, a, a very big swing against them. Uh, and pretty much all of this vote from both Labor and the Greens went to went to Monique Ryan. And then that, that, that sort of 6.5% uh, swing, a lot of that went to to Ryan as well. So she actually almost won on the primary vote. Then with our preferential system, and you could say that this is a negative or a positive, but she was able to get elected through preferences from Labor, from the Greens and so on, uh, which is, you know, you could argue that that is a positive or a negative. It, 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 it could be a very interesting essay point as well. So even though Frydenberg had a very big uh, profile, the election um, turfed him out. It was interesting. Um, if you, if any of you watched Insiders, I think the day after the election, there was a bit of commentary around the fact that they were thinking of maybe running uh, posters that say, "Well, if you if if you vote for Ryan, you get Dutton and things like that," which is ultimately what's turned out to happen. But in, interesting that I think uh, they were aware, at the very least, in Kuyong of, of of a potential loss on the cards. One that probably uh, hasn't been. Uh, oh, very good point in the chat there. Um, yes, we will get to the Senate. That, that caused some last minute edits to this PowerPoint today. Um, in, in terms of popular participation, this is one that might've got overlooked. It, it came up, I think, on the on the plea with Instagram page um, regarding delegated legislation. So the fact that if you were diagnosed with COVID or you tested positive, <clears throat> Um, in that period in the run-up to the election, you had actually a very small window where you could be disenfranchised. Uh, I think it was the Tuesday of, of election week. If you hadn't applied for a postal vote, there was no guarantee you'd actually be able to vote. Uh, and Monique Ryan basically proposed legal action um, to stop this from occurring. Um, it never actually got to that stage. The AEC stepped in um, and they changed the rules. But if we're looking here at with a bit of an eye on the Unit 4 process and, and, and certainly comparing... Australia's voting system to the US. We know there's lots of disenfranchisement going on in the US and whatnot and, and, and some of the issues they had in their presidential election in 2020. Well, this is Australia responding to that and upholding that, that democratic principle. Um, and interestingly, if you dig down into the booth numbers as well, uh, which is something worthwhile doing, a bit of a politics nerd thing to do, but if you go through the AEC's Tally Room website, you can click on the individual booths. So what could be interesting is you could see where you, know, you went to vote with your parents um, for example, see actually who voted for who. You can click on the primary school you went to and you can see uh, the votes there. Of the phone votes in Kuyong, 47% of these went to Monique Ryan. It wasn't a huge number, but interesting that that actually may have you know, sort of helped her uh, get a few extra votes. Um, if it was a bit tighter, that, that, that potentially could have helped her get over the line. Important thing to note here as well, that this applied across the nation. So it wasn't just in the seat of Kuyong, it applied everywhere. So it, it, it increased the franchise for... 
um, potentially a lot of people in Western Australia because we were going through a, you know, a decent COVID wave at, at, at the time. What have we got? A few more questions. So this election, people were saying to vote against politicians they don't like. Could this potentially be a reason for the rise of the independence? Uh, I think so, is the answer. Uh, I, I, I don't profess to be um, Anthony Green level of election analysis, uh, but I think certainly Scott Morrison had had some issues in terms of popularity. I think if you dive into West in, into the Western Australian data, that would probably confirm that, given the low numbers of UAP votes as well. There does become a point as well in any election cycle where people just get sick of the government. They just want a new government. It's not necessarily that the politicians are bad politicians. I think Josh Frydenberg, for example, is a is a loss to the parliament that that he has left. Um, but ultimately, sometimes the the swings on people want change, and yeah, I think we've we've seen a little bit of that in this election. But keep the questions coming; always enjoyable. Okay, one that we'll, we'll move back to Queensland. Have a look at the, the green slide as it's been uh, referred to. So Greens, so there's Adam Banton there. He's the leader of the Greens. Uh, he has been in the House of Reps for a number of years now, uh, but he was the, the lonely Greens member in the House of Reps. So obviously a significant representation in the Senate, but not so much in the Reps. They now have, he, he now has a few friends. So uh, he's got, four members in the House of Reps now. The other three have all come from Queensland. So Brisbane, Griffith and Ryan. For those of you that remember Kevin Rudd, Griffith was Kevin Rudd's old seat when he was, uh, when he was Prime Minister. Uh, Brisbane and Ryan were both held by the LNP. So just an, an important little differentiation there. Uh, there's no Liberal Party per se in Queensland. It's a Liberal and National Party. They combine together officially, not through a, not through a coalition as they do elsewhere. Uh, and Griffith was held by Shadow Minister Terry Butler, which is interesting in that her loss has probably influenced the representation of women um, in, our, in our new ministry. So they polled 12.3% of the popular vote nationally. That's half of the Liberal Party's vote on first preference. Now, what I mean by the Liberal Party is just the Liberals. So not the Liberal and National Party, not, not the National Party, just the Liberals. So the Liberals in Victoria and in, and in Western Australia and so on. So, but, you know, Yes, they are a minor party, but you, know, you could make an argument that, well, if, if you took the Nationals out of the Liberal Party, how much vote would they actually be getting? And interestingly as well, and you can see Penny here, she's just holding the dental and Medicare uh, with the glasses and blonde hair. They actually picked up an extra Senate seat in, in Queensland as well. And she bases herself in regional Queensland, uh, which is really interesting given the last election, there was a massive swing away from the left parties. Um, they had, you know, Adani, you know, anti-Adani convoys going into regional Queensland towns and sort of being shouted out of town. And yet three years later, they've, they've put all these Greens into Parliament. So it, it shows how quickly these changes can occur, uh, which is one of the joys of politics and law and that all of your examples for elections are now void and these are all the new ones you now have to learn. It, things change very quickly. Uh, Edward, do teal independents, regular independents have legislative power or can they just sway debate on the crossbench? Well, in terms of the teals, um, they, well, theoretically, they don't have any power because the, the government has a majority uh, on the floor of the house. They have enough seats to get sort of stuff pass through but they will have power because if if the Labor Party chooses to ignore them then they will potentially face a, a teal revolution or something along those lines in their sort of heartland seats as well um, I think the electorate has made it very clear that they want some action on some specific issues so that will be I think something that the government will have to consider and at the very least if they just try and ram through legislation through the House of Reps then they'll meet a brick wall in the Senate um, and that the Greens and David Pocock, for example, in Canberra, who's just got in, um, they won't allow sort of things to get through. So whilst they can get legislation through the reps, they will have to work with the Teals and people like Helen Haynes and so on uh, to get to get legislation passed, I think, as well. Brandon, so, yes. just quickly, um, under the Morrison government, we saw five backbenchers cross the floor during a, a vote on the Human Rights Legislation Amendment Act. Um, which was attached to the religious discrimination bills. Given that there's only a two seat majority in the lower house, why wouldn't we see a similar thing for Labor? 
What's different about them? Um, it's a good question. Labor, I, I mean, the Liberal Party always, part, I mean, the Liberal Party was very supportive of that crossing the floor motion because they allow people to speak their minds and whatnot. Mm. The Labor Party has a lot of factions. Um, so the left and right faction being very powerful and that's what determines the ministries, for example. The, the same thing could easily happen to the Labor Party um, in that if you have individual members that are worried, especially in a seat like Hunter, for example, if the government is being pushed to pass legislation that might bring forward coal mine closures and whatnot and things like that, and people in those electorates are worried about losing their seats, or, so worried about losing their jobs, which will then flow into potentially that, that local member losing their seat, I would suggest you would see some pushback from those members. Joel, Joel, Joel Fitzgibbon was very much... Um, along those lines when he was the member um, for Hunter. So the same thing could easily happen. Small majorities make it very difficult for a government to govern when you get a few rogue MPs. So, I mean, it would be nice if Parliament was sitting because we could see where they were going to go. But three years is a long time. As we know in the Labor Party, they like to change prime ministers. So um, we could certainly see some changes there. Um, with the Labor Party, and I, uh, this is something that I know in principle that in the Constitution, if parliamentary members vote against... Uh, I guess, the, the party platform, they can be ejected from the party. In practice, do we know if that's common or not? Or is that something I need to go and research? <laughs> uh, it would be one I'd need to go and research. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> it would be a good thing for a representation, right? It Whether would be. It, I, yeah. I think, I mean, it's one that I've, I've brought up with students previously in terms of the same-sex marriage um, legislation that, that was passed and that, some of the highest no votes were in Labor held seats um, and they still had to vote yes in Parliament to support that to support that legislation. So whilst it's not a contemporary example now, that certainly shows how Labor can ignore representation functions by going with what, what the leader wants, um, which is not necessary. I mean, we saw with the Libs, for example, Tony Abbott, Scott, Scott Morrison sat outside the Parliament, um, didn't, you know, didn't come in the doors, but the Labor members were, yeah, were, were sort of forced to vote yes. Thanks, Brennan. <laughs> oh, dramas, all good. Okay, mandates. This was another good line. Um, if you can cast your mind back six weeks ago, uh, when I think this was when Albanese was being sort of, um, I guess, pressured on not, not knowing unemployment rates. And I think the journalist got up at the press club and asked Adam Ban some obscure economic figure. And I think he answered this quite well and just said, well, you know, Google it, mate. Um, would strongly suggest this, not, not to necessarily Google, but if you're unsure about anything that, you know, that's coming up here, do your own research. Um, yes, your teachers are there to provide you with guidance and are there to, to help you out. But they're not going to be a font of all knowledge because there is so much to know and you guys are so adept at finding information. So whether it's doing your own internet research or just absorbing the news, um, the, the seven o'clock news on the ABC is wonderful. 7.30 is, you know, is really good too. Insiders, you know, find, find podcasts that are out there. Um, the more you absorb this information, the, the easier it is to apply in assessments because it's, it's not something that you can just study the night before and yeah, I'll be right. You, you really do have to immerse yourself in it. So yeah, some advice there from, from Adam Bant. Um, in terms of mandates, again, like I sort of touched on at the start, this is something that's really, I guess, theoretical um, and that no, no uh, political party goes to an election and says, I want to win the right to oppose mandate. Um, you know, you'd, you'd be silly if you were doing that. So they're, they're theoretical things that, that we apply after the fact. But the Greens really rent to the election with, I guess, an ability to seek a mandate. They, they wanted, you know, there was many times where Adam Bant was quoted as wanting to seek a balance of power mandate. Um, and ultimately, they will have it. They won't have it in the House of Reps, which is potentially where they were angling for. But in the Senate, they are the, the biggest presence outside of the major parties. So 12 seats in the Senate is huge. Um, it means that Labor can't pass legislation without them unless they get together with the coalition, which on some issues they might be able to, but on some, on, on, on some other issues they might not be able to. So the Greens, their, their mandate was pretty clear. Uh, no new coal and gas mines. They want increases to Medicare, so including dental, for example, in there. Childcare free, uh, one that might appeal to a few teachers out here or some prospective students, they wanted to wipe hex debt as well. So rather than go forward with the next stage of tax cuts, the idea was to wipe um, hex debt that, that was available. So 
they had some really clear policies. Whether or not electors voted for those specific policies, we won't know. Um, there is certainly a trend where people vote for Labor in the House of Reps and the Greens in the Senate, but you, you can make a case for, they did pick up three seats in Queensland. Um, they have increased their vote nationally. People maybe are swinging towards that. It's not just teal independence. So an interesting quote from Adam Bant down the bottom there said, on election night, you know, this, this, this result is a mandate for action on climate and inequality. He, he is claiming a mandate there. So he, he's taking the theory and putting it into practice, which is something we love to do in PL. Um, he's he's giving you some really good information there and some really good examples to use. In terms of some other mandates that exist, the teal is the one um, that's there. Again, their mandate was a real specific mandate. They went with specific policies. Um, you could argue that both major parties, Labor don't like this notion of a small target campaign, but both went with a reasonably small target. Um, as is often the case in elections, it was a lot of scare campaign. Don't vote for these guys because they'll do X, Y, and Z. Um, the Libs had some very good ads. You, I'm sure you all remember the, the hole in your bucket song and things like that. But ultimately, there wasn't a whole lot. Um, and I think that was evidenced by the, the Liberal Party campaign launch the week before the election where Morrison came out with a new housing policy that really hadn't been tested before. You know, it was announced a week out. I think certainly something for people to consider uh, in popular participation um, and certainly in unit two as well with elections is that so many people vote before election day now. Uh, this year, like the last election was before it, were the highest numbers of pre-poll voting. Um, some of that was to do with COVID, but some people just don't like voting and want to get it out of the way. Do you really have a mandate as a political party if people voted before you announced your full suite of policies? Uh, the opposition at the time, didn't announce any of their costings until the Thursday before the election. So you've got potentially millions of people voting for a political party and they don't know how any of this is going to be paid for. And you might think, well, why is that important? Well, we're staring down a pretty big economic crisis at the moment and people have voted for policies that potentially might not go ahead because we can't fund them anymore. So yes, there are specific mandates that exist, but these general mandates are really problematic given how people are voting now um, in elections. Okay, so some ideas here. Uh, again, year 11s, please don't think, oh, well, why is, you know, how am I going to use this? This is stuff that you can potentially get in, in, in assessments this year, but you can really start to get your head around, what am I going to be asked to do next year? Um, in terms of mandates, that does come up pretty early. I know a lot of schools start their, their year 12s in term four, for example. So these are concepts that are going to hit you pretty quickly. So I've, I've put a range of questions here. Some of these are available on SCARS's website. I'm sure by now, most of you know how to use SCARS's website to find information on politics and law. Um, if you don't, it's a very simple Google search. Um, SCARS of politics and law will, will take you where you need to go. Um, these are past exam questions. So some, the first one there, for example, just being a, a short answer response. The last one there being um, a, a um, essay response. And you can see here, I guess, where we could apply some examples. So certainly the first one, we could look at the Greens um, being a minor party in the Senate, um, for example, um, and or an independent. So remember when you get the choice, you don't have to do both. Um, the second one, when we're looking at a mandate when it only suits, um, an interesting one with this, it's not in this slideshow, uh, but was the, I guess the, the worry maybe from Labor that they weren't going to form a majority and they're very publicly through Tony Burke, who is now, uh, the the leader of the house sort of saying yes you know look, we'll do some work with the crossbench and we'll let them have more questions and we'll and we'll look at reforms to Dorothy Dix's and then not long after the election the rhetoric had slightly changed um, and again you know they're going towards an election year we're going to clean up parliament and then actually now it doesn't suit us too much because we've got a majority so we don't mind if a few Dorothy Dix's get asked that that's an example I guess where you could either support that claim or you can find certainly in terms of the the uh, election of independence and, a, and an increased crossbench that refute that claim um, as well. In terms of the last one, recent Commonwealth parliaments uh, have confirmed that the ability of governments to implement their mandate is more a function of the will of the parliament than the will of the people. Well, we've got some great evidence that can, um, I guess, argue against that. And we've got lots of people who are now in parliament because maybe parliament wasn't doing its job in terms of representation and, and uh, establishing effective mandates beforehand. So just some ideas there on how to on how to function your work. Um, again, 
you know, the best thing to do. And I, and I think um, Hayley Pepper, who's, who's presented a few times before, has the best advice for this. If, if you can write an essay on a syllabus point, you can write a short answer or you can write a, a source analysis response. You can see, Daniel, you've put the link in, in the chat there as well. All righty, moving on. How am I for time, Daniel? Uh, good, we got about 15-ish minutes. Yep. Well, we got, we got plenty of time, you're all good. Ring the bell if, it, if, I'm, if <laughs> I'm going too long, just like they do in parliament, hurry me up, um, like, like mock trials. Um, so Scott Morrison, in terms of roles and powers of the PM, we can apply this to both PMs. I, I would suggest with this, if you're looking at certainly elections, try and keep it relevant, try and keep it recent. So don't go down Kevin Rudd or Julia Gillard pathway, even though the syllabus may allow that. In terms of recent examples, stick with the recent PMs. So Albanese, Morrison, and if you want to look at something like double dissolution, you could look at Turnbull. So Morrison called the election as late as he possibly could to give himself the most amount of campaign time. Again, that's his choice. That That's, that's a power that he has. Um, there were only 10 sitting days before the election was going to be called. So really trying to limit scrutiny there. Um, that kind of backfired on the government because they had MPs across the floor. So it didn't quite work out how the Prime Minister wanted to, but that, that was the intention, no doubt. Parliament, we know, is going to come back at the end of July. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the East Coast in terms of power prices and, and economic stresses and things like that, which you could argue the government probably should be doing something about a little bit earlier rather than saying, wait to the budget. But ultimately, that's, you know, that's the PM's choice. Um, and what was very interesting so so soon after the election that there was you know the pm was off he was off to the quad meeting so he had to have some ministers to to sort of steer the ship uh he swore in an interim ministry a, a, a couple of select ministers who took on lots of different portfolios until until the ministry could be um could be ironed out which leads us to our to our new ministry so there they are there um in in terms of ministry and cabinet make sure you know the difference between the two uh, if, if you're a cabinet minister, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as just being a, you know, an assistant minister, for example. So make sure you're across that. I think that came up in the waste paper last year, something along the lines of cabinet. I could be, I could be wrong. But 10, 10, 10 women in cabinet is the most we've ever had um, in an Australian cabinet, slightly down from, from the shadow cabinet, but we've lost people like Terry Butler, for example. So that could help to explain that. Uh, two Muslim ministers, it's the first time that's happened, um, Ann Ali and Ed Husick. Uh, so that's that's a really significant moment for Australia as well. Um, with a bit of a WA lens, uh, three ministers from WA with one assistant minister uh, being a reasonably important role um, in that Patrick Gorman, um, the assistant minister for the prime minister. So yeah, a bit of WA representation. There is always the gatekeeper for Anthony Albanese. I guess one that was interesting, and we talk about factions in the Labor Party, um, the person in yellow there, uh, Tanya Plibersek, was the education minister very uh, much across that uh, shadow ministry um, whilst in opposition, removed from that portfolio um, and placed um, into a different portfolio into the environment, which is an important portfolio, but certainly one that shows that maybe her allegiances to Bill Shorten in the previous opposition, maybe those sort of Labor, uh, I guess, tribal factions are coming out there as well. So, so it's something of note, not, not necessarily something to, I guess, focus too much on, but just interesting to see how the Labor Party works, how the political party factions work and so on. The opposition, uh, obviously, when you lose an election, you, you're into opposition. Um, I, I think this, is, this has been interesting in that a lot of who was going to be the Liberal Party leader was basically um, determined on election night. So Frydenberg losing his seat was a big deal. Uh, we've got important members like, like Ken White, for example, who was the minister, the first Indigenous minister um, for Indigenous affairs. Trent Zimmerman, so a moderate. Uh, Dave Sharma, a moderate, and Ben Morton, who was also the assistant minister uh, for the prime minister. But, you know, he was a very close confidant of, of Scott Morrison. Uh, and he had a, a, a real surprise shock, shock election result um, for, for him, which was, you know, a very, a very safe seat. So for him to lose that, that, that was interesting. Uh, he certainly would have played a pretty big role um, in, the, in the opposition as well. So we've got our two new leaders there, Dutton, Dutton on the left and David Littleproud, uh, on the right, so the Nationals had a had a spill as well. Barnaby was replaced, uh, and fr uh, not Frondberg, sorry, a little proud replace Barnaby Joyce's leader. I like the cartoon there from Matt from Matt Golding. You know, going back to the sensible centre, 
uh, and you're trying to drag along Barnaby Joyce and Matt, Matt Canavan, which is a very tough task for David Littlecrout. I don't, I don't envy his task at all. In terms of where they sit, so Dutton more on the right compared to Morrison. Morrison would, could, could sort of play both sides of the party uh, and Little Proud is certainly more moderate than Barnaby Joyce. Um, Barnaby Joyce would feel somewhat hard done by though, given that the Nationals didn't lose any seats. Um, and there was a big sort of claim in, in the rise of the Teals that, well, if you vote for Trent Zimmerman or you vote for Jason Felinski, you're voting for Barnaby Joyce. And as Barnaby right, rightly points out, well, there's 151 individual electorates. We won all our seats. That's not his fault that, um, you know, these these inner city seats couldn't couldn't hold theirs. So there's some interesting notes in terms of the opposition. Senate, uh, Pauline almost, almost got kicked out of the Senate. Um, there's a bit going on today in terms of the Senate, which is the beauty of elections. So you see down the bottom there, uh, United Australia Party picked up a seat, as was pointed out before um, in Victoria, which again, it's a very left-leaning part of the world uh, for the UAP to get a seat there. Most people think Queensland, maybe New South Wales, but yeah, in Victoria, uh, which is interesting. So 40 of the 76 seats were up for grabs at this election. Uh, neither party was able to command a majority. And, and, and that a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that you have the other, the other seats, the, you know, the continuing members that were not up for re-election. So you're looking at accountability and whatnot, and that a senator with that six-year term can miss the swing. You know, someone in the Liberal Party who was already standing for their extra, you know, three years to go, they could avoid potentially the anger against the government. And who knows, in three years' time, people might be upset at the Labor Party and they might increase their majority. They might increase their vote share. So it's just one of the nuances of the Senate. Some results of note. So Jackie Lambie Network picks up another seat as well. Uh, in the Senate, David Pocock, uh, for those of you that are familiar with your rugby, an ex-rugby union player um, for Australia, he's now um, a senator for the ACT. He took a seat away from the Liberal Party there um, and the UAP in there, One Nation retaining their two seats um, with Pauline Hats and getting another six-year term. So really sort of interesting dynamic now in that the Liberal and National Party doesn't have enough to pass legislation or to block legislation in their own right. Uh, and they don't actually have enough in terms of the natural coalition partners. So the Greens probably aren't going to do a whole lot with, with the LNP, but One Nation probably will. You would imagine the UAP would, would, would sort of side uh, with the coalition on most things, which means that if the Labor Party wants to get stuff through, they do have a passage, but it's got to be through the Greens, it's got to be through Jackie Lambie, it's got to be through David Pocock, and there's a few competing interests in there as well. Jackie Lambie is, is a incredibly interesting political figure but she can switch you know she's not a guaranteed she will always vote this way and who knows what her what what her new partner in the senate will be like as well so lots of interesting things going on there if we're looking at accountability for the government they can get stuff through the house of reps but this is going to be ultimately where they are able to govern or not um, and will they be able to get legislation through which will be interesting to see okay some different areas. Uh, you can tie this into your human rights component of the syllabus. Obviously, the referendum is is one that is quite tricky, uh, really, before this election. Because, well, what's a proposed referendum? Is it is it a thought bubble? Is it an idea? Do we actually have to be before the people? Well, looks like we're going to have some really rich examples to call upon over the next few years. So, if you did watch uh, the prime minister on election night when he was, you know, was addressing the nation um, and thanking his supporters, this this was a big deal. Uh, for him and that he wanted to commit to, in full to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Now, and he was very clear in full. Uh, and the wording is important because uh, the Greens have some differing opinions as, as to how this should be delivered. Uh, but it includes a voice to parliament, treaty and truth. Uh, and in that order, uh, which is important to note as well. Uh, and also to not necessarily something that will be before uh, voters in this electoral cycle, but we do have an assistant minister for the Republic, which signals the intent of the government to potentially go down that path. Now, it's not gonna be a first term priority. It, it will be if they win government, which is not guaranteed um, again in 2025, but we, we've got a bit of areas to sort of move in here. So this hopefully gives you some, some, some examples you can use um, if potentially this comes up in an exam. Um, and certainly for year 11s, maybe you're assessed on this in semester one next year. This is, you know, this is some really interesting stuff. So as you can see with the cartoon there, uh, if you remember back to election day, the, 
text message went out to lots of people uh, regarding boats arriving from, I think it was from Sri Lanka. Uh, but that was sort of the government's last act was to remind people of that. Uh, but the first act, and this was announced on the night, was 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 this, I guess, proposal to to really push forward with a referendum. So the timeframe's not 100% set yet, but it, we know it's in the works. Uh, it could be next year. Maybe it's a bit more likely to be next year once the government gets settled in a little bit more. The tricky thing for the government here is going to be, what, what does this voice look like? Uh, and Peter Dutton was on Insiders on Sunday and sort of saying that, well, yeah, I might support it, but I need to see what the model looks like. And getting to that model is going to be a really tricky thing for the government because they're going to have to really get a lot of um, opinions together to, to get a uniform proposal here because uh, we know how hard referendums are to be passed, eight of 44 uh, successful. The most recent one with, you know, with the Republic fell, you know, fell over. Uh, so we haven't had a referendum proposal for a very long time and people are often suspicious of the government or the parliament trying to get more power. So they will have to be careful with this. Um, there is some there is some cross party support. So Linda Burney uh, is the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. She is also Indigenous as well, which I think is 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 really important too. So she will be responsible primarily for this. Pat Pat Dodson uh, is a senator for Labor as well, who will have a bit to do with this, uh, but also the opposition, because ultimately you need to get the opposition on board here for it to be a bit of a bit of a unity ticket. Uh, Julian Lisa uh, is a known supporter of the Uluru Statement. So what impact will he have? On, on Peter Dutton and, and coalition partners in terms of getting this getting this up as well. Uh, yes, Daniel, you're right. And, and, and this was a, a bit of an interesting difference with the Greens and that they don't agree with the proposal uh, of well, the order of, of sort of implementing this Uluru Statement from the heart. And will the Greens, I guess, remain steadfast with that? And will they say, no, we're, we want to do it in the order we want to do it in, otherwise we're not going to support it? Or will they work with the government and, and have a bipartisan approach. The Greens and the Labor Party don't always agree. Brendan, um, can I just yes. add in there, this is actually really useful for Year 11s if you're looking at a contemporary issue relating to representation. The criticism around the Uluru State from the heart is that that process of calling together different cultural groups around Australia was flawed in itself and that the Uluru State from the heart isn't representative um, or fully representative. So if you translate that into, well, what does the voice to parliament look like? Is it in the constitution? Is it an advisory body? How does it compare to previous uh, advisory bodies like ASIC, um, it, it's actually quite a, a deep issue that you can look into, along with things like, you know, the representation of Indigenous people in Parliament, given that now they are above parity, I think, in the Parliament itself. So there are there's a higher percentage of Indigenous members of Parliament than there are members of the population in general. Yes, it, it is certainly an issue that will be very interesting to watch. Um, one that's not so much on the government's priority at the moment, but is certainly there, uh, is the Republic. So the bonus with this is Julian Lisa down the bottom there is both the, op is, is the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Affairs, but also the opposition spokesperson on the Republic, has two differing views. He is a supporter or known supporter of, of the Uluru Statement, but not so much for a Republic. So if we're looking at, you know, economy of examples here, that's, you know, that's something to help the memory bank out. Uh, Matt Thistlewaite is up the top there on the left. Uh, you should all know who the person on the right is. Uh, he's the Assistant Minister for the Republic. And we can see there that this wasn't something that the government actually took to the election. There, was, there wasn't a lot made of this. Uh, so again, if you're looking at, I guess, how representative they are or how much they're following on with the mandate, this is something that has been really at the discretion of the Prime Minister, because we know that realistically, he, he's the one that sets the portfolios. Um, Matt Thistleway has been quite clear that they're not pushing for it in this term. It's around education and what the model of the Republic would look like. And nothing's really going to happen uh, until the monarch changes. So until Queen Elizabeth reign, Queen Elizabeth's reign ends uh, and, and potentially, you know, Prince Charles would be the next in line, uh, that would be the sort of time frame that we would be looking at. So whenever that occurs, that's maybe when the wheels might start to get in motion. Who knows? Maybe the royals go down a different route. Maybe Prince Harry comes back. Who knows? We'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, some, some waste questions here as well. Uh, so two barriers posed by party politics to constitutional reform in Australia. So that's certainly something you could look at uh, in terms of barriers with the Republic in that Julian Lisa is a known, uh, I guess, supporter of the monarchy. 
that that's going to be some issues with party politics there. I would imagine that the Liberal Party would have a sizable wing that would be against um, a change in the monarchy um, to a republic. Then if you're looking at, say, outline one current re reform proposal, uh, then you could look at something like, um, I would suggest the voice of parliament would be the one to do because that's sort of going to be in this term of parliament. I guess getting back to the first one as well, you could always use another referendum as well. So you could talk about two reforms potentially and you could look at the Greens opposition to the voice of parliament um, as well. One current reform proposal, I would stick to voice to parliament, uh, but you've got two there that are really useful um, rather than say, digging around trying to find stuff for local government or maybe section 44 changes and things like that. You've got some real tangible examples now to use, which, which is very useful um, going forward for both year 12s this year, but, but, but for the current year 11s as well. Question in the chat. If Australia becomes a republic, will we leave the Commonwealth and will our flag will be changed? Well, that's all to be determined in the model, isn't it? So that would be, I guess, some of the things we would vote for. Um, I don't know. Would we still participate in the Commonwealth Games? I know countries like South Africa do, for example, as well in India. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to win gold medals somehow. So we might have a little caveat there that we get to stay in the Commonwealth Games, um, but just change everything else. Who knows? I mean, we've seen the changes with Brexit and whatnot in the UK. That's very messy still. Um, so it whatever happens will, won't, won't be an overnight process. It will take a bit of time. Uh, will the currency design change? Good, good question. But, but perhaps the the more uh, pressing question is what happens when we have a new monarch, you know, when all the currency gets changed over there as well. So all, all questions to be answered, they would all be part of the reform proposals, but um, certainly not something that's going to be pushed in the current parliament. Bit of a random uh, add-on, but the flag design is currently controlled by the Governor General under the Flags Act. It's one of their legislative powers. Nice little link to our syllabus stop points. Um, so I imagine that if we were to change for Republic, the the government of the day would probably have some say as to what our flag and or currency would look like mm -hmm. so we might might have a design contest or something we could get what well, what was the one new zealand had with the laser kiwi or something like that i think did that did that always become their national flag yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh so over over to to you i guess um we've got what have we got sort of 10 or so minutes left Oh, uh, yeah, roughly about that. So we got, yeah, 602, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anyone's got questions, now's the time. Please don't be scared. The, any question, whatever you like to ask, use this opportunity. I really do have very few questions, so please save me from this awkward silence, but I do have one to fill it. <laughs> um, Peter Dutton in his image rebrand following the, the coalition defeat, I suppose, in the election. Um, even though in that political cartoon you showed, it showed, you know, the, the nationals being dragged back towards a sensible centre, uh, Dutton suggested that most of the, well, many of the Liberals that lost their seats were moderates and therefore there was a bit of a mandate for the, the Liberal Party at least to return to a more conservative um, frame. What do you think the opposition's mandate is based on at the moment, if anything? <laughs> um, it would be interesting to see what style of opposition leader Dutton is. I, I, I think if he forms himself in the mould of Tony Abbott, he could be quite effective um, in that a lot of that mandate was just say no to what the government does and, and really prosecute that, which was very effective. Um, I, I think the, the trouble that we have now is we're in this weird little limbo period where Anything that goes wrong, the government blames the, the previous government. It's all their fault. And the opposition sits there and says, well, th these are all the things that we would do, but then didn't do any of that in government. I, I think once we get a budget, I think certainly when we had a, the last sort of change of government with Abbott in 2013, their first budget was, was a real problem. Uh, and that really gave the opposition a mandate to attack a lot of the policies that came out. So once we get maybe to October and we see what Jim Chalmers comes up with in the budget, potentially if there's cuts as well to things that weren't promised or increase in taxes as the government of, you know, at the time was saying that that Labor will do, that would be interesting to see. I, I don't think Dutton has a clear mandate yet because the government hasn't given himself anything to really attack or prosecute at the moment. Awesome. All right, got plenty of questions in the chat. Keep them coming. Um, is it likely that there'll be a Labor leadership challenge? Mm -hmm. 
Um, <laughs> there's always a possibility with the Labor Party, isn't it? Um, look, I think certainly given the fact that Tanya Plibersek and Bill Shorten have been sidelined into portfolios that, it, you know, it, it, it is derogatory to call the NDIS and the environment not important in terms of the grand scheme of things. They aren't the most senior portfolios. I think that shows that Albanese is worried about a potential challenge. Um, ultimately, though, the electorate doesn't like Bill Shorten because he lost he's lost two elections. But um, Tanya certainly is popular uh, and she polls very well. So is is Albanese worried about a leadership challenge? Uh, potentially. Yeah. Um, how did exhaustive preferential votes have a role in this election? Um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah. I, look, I think if we go back to that graph from from before and, and and hopefully when the when the slideshow comes out, you can have a look at that. Um, I think the, the tallyroom.com.au was the, was the source I used for that. We are going down the ballot slip a lot more. Uh, and I know for the electorate, for example, that I voted in, there were 11 different choices I could make. So it, it's not just a case if you just vote for one of the major parties, given that people have got so much more choice now uh, and that people aren't necessarily a fan of both major parties, they're getting something like, 30% each of the primary vote, you've got at least a third of the electorate that wants a different voice in parliament. Uh, and that's where I think exhaustive preferential voting is really coming in. Um, and we'll um, see if that trend continues. Charlotte, if you don't mind me referencing um, some work by Stephen King, he points out that preferential voting uh, with this swing towards third party candidates has provided a path to their victory. And all really minor parties and independents need to do is keep the primary vote of the major parties in a seat below 45%. They need to finish second uh, in the overall race. And then what they do is they benefit from the preference flows from other minor parties and independents. And that gives them a better chance of uh, finishing with an absolute majority, which is often what a lot of the independents uh, and the Greens have done, is that they benefited from the preference froze from Labor or from other minor parties. So with this rise of the independents and the minor parties, preferential voting and exhaustive preferential voting has actually given them a path to victory. Well said. Well said. What else have we got? Um, what effect does each... What effect does each party having factions have on the parliament? Oh, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I think with Labor, it, it determines the ministries, right? So the left and the right mm. factions get a certain quota. Uh, where the prime minister comes from also impacts where uh, the ministries are allocated. The unions play a role with Labor as well and that a lot of uh, ministers are union-backed. So if you want to keep the unions on side, you have to put them in important portfolios uh, as well. So that's... That's the role the factions play. Not, I mean, different in the Liberal Party in that they are a broad church. Labor is much easier. It's left or right. Um, it's much more easier to determine. Yeah, in saying that though, the the Libs, uh, the moderate factions, certainly had quite a. They took quite a hit during the election, especially losing uh, Josh Frydenberg, who was basically like their leader in Parliament. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether, because there are a number of conservative. Liberal candidate like members still in the parliament, whether they swing towards more conservative policies. Um, Labor lost ground on the left to the Greens. Liberal lost ground to the centre, uh, in the centre to independents. What are your thoughts on the centre being reclaimed by a centrist party like the Australian Democrats or Xenophon's centre alliance? Uh, well, I mean, a remnant of Xenophon's party is Rebecca Sharkey, uh, mm. who does particularly well in Mayo. Uh, in South Australia, so there is a, a a a voice, or there is a there is a grounds for the support for that group. Um, I mean, also, I mean, I, I mean, I think the Teals are an embodiment of that. They they they're not controversial. They basically reflect pretty moderate views, really. Uh, in that, yeah, we can see that action needs to be had on climate change. National Integrity Commission, I think most people would argue, is a good thing. You can debate about the model, but I mean parliamentarians should be held to account they're held to account through elections why not through other means um so could that happen where does it happen i think it's happened in the reps with with the teals does it happen a little bit more in the senate maybe the greens become are becoming more appealing to those moderate types of voters uh, and that they're not considered to be just an environmental party now they maybe have some other policies um lambie i think is a great embodiment of that as well um so i think 
not necessarily one party, but lots of individual voices coming together to form that central sort of alliance seems to be occurring. Yes, um, as a bit of a tangent with Centre Alliance, a very interesting example of the, I guess, Senate representation accountability is that Rex Patrick uh, lost his seat in the Senate. If you didn't know, Rex Patrick, uh, he won, well, he didn't win any seat. He was never directly elected. Nick Xenophon won a seat in the Senate in, I think, 2016. So he he got a six-year term. He then left the parliament and his casual vacancy was filled by Rex Patrick uh, on a Centre Alliance ticket. Rex Patrick then became an independent, so he left Centre Alliance to, as, to sit as an independent in the parliament, and then he was defeated in 2000, the, the 2022 election, and I think he only got yeah, a very, not, not a, definitely not a quota, a very, very small number of votes. So my question that I've always had, even though I think he was a very effective member of parliament, is who the hell was he representing? <laughs> well, Malcolm Roberts is, you know, is similar, isn't he, as well? Um, Fraser Anning was an interesting one. But once mm. they get in, how do you get rid of them? But yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, one for you, Daniel, I think. I know, just trying to read through it. So <laughs> interesting point earlier on Indigenous representation being above um, parity with the 2022 outcome will it result in meaning or lasting meaningful or lasting change well I suppose if you look at broader determinants of lasting change things like closing the gap targets um, we found out last year that those tar many of those targets have not actually been met um, the proposal for constitutional recognition and change has been around for decades uh, so if you want to talk about lasting change it's not happening very quickly. Um, the voice to parliament, the, I don't, I'm not as familiar with the new candidates, but certainly beforehand, the Indigenous members of parliament were sort of split along party lines. People like Lydia Thorpe were very much adamant that a treaty is necessary and that a voice to parliament, the concept could be, could be flawed um, if this body just deferred to parliament rather than actually, you know, asserting its influence over the legislative process, whereas someone like Ken Wyatt um, wanted it to be an advisory body, didn't necessarily require constitutional change, which was very in line with sort of what the Liberal Party and Scott Morrison were, were proposing. So there's, I think, you, I guess the, the problem with mirror representation is that, yes, there are people from different backgrounds in the parliament, but at the end of the day, they are still subject to the party system that is so dominant in Australia's parliament, um, which is what and partisan representation can, can stimmy some of these more broader, more meaningful changes. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave that there. Have we got, have we got any others? They're all, the, the numbers have stayed quite good, actually. I'm, I'm well done for hanging in for an hour and 15. You've done, you've done better than I could have. Absolutely. <laughs> All righty. Any well, last minute questions? Yeah. Now, <laughs> now's your question. Questions without notice, as they'd say in the parliament. <laughs> All right, then. I think we might leave it there. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending uh, and being so so attentive and engaged during uh, during this masterclass. Um, this PowerPoint, as well as this recording, will be made available to you as soon as I can wrangle it and put it all together. <laughs> um, Brennan, thank you so much for being our, our election expert on this night. <laughs> I wouldn't go as far as expert, but hopefully <laughs> you got something out of this that, that you can use um, going forward. So thank you for listening um, and thank you for all participating. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.